The Gospel reading this morning comes from the 16th chapter of Mark. Hear now God's word. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go. Tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The grass withers The flower fades, but my friends, the word of God stands forever. Amen. Taking the hand of the stranger, whose warmth makes him an immediate friend, She says expectantly, prayerfully even, remember us, remember us. When he says, yes, we will, he means it. And he and his fellow missionaries will return. They will return to that place to show her how they had remembered This conversation takes place on a hot day in the African bush, in a small village where home is a mud dwelling, most often with a thatched roof. A few of the huts have metal roofs showing the greater affluence of those families. In all of the dwellings, Families routinely gather around a simple meal that takes place on the floor of their hut. But when they have visitors, everything changes. Like Mary and Martha do for Jesus, the villagers show genuine, even sacrificial hospitality. Perhaps it's a bit like our covered dish dinners. One family prepares fruits, another vegetables that they have grown. Another shares a freshly plucked hen from the yard. Still others tend to the needs of the guests, telling stories, providing welcome. And the women, especially the very young and the old, they walk. They walk five miles from their bush village to the district of Mwandi. A 20-liter bucket rests on their heads. In Mwandi, they seek clean water for their guests. Their filled buckets, weighing nearly 45 pounds, provide safe drinking water and water in which to wash and cook the bounty they will soon share with their guests. Of course, for the women, the return trip, balancing the heavy bucket of water, is difficult. Mabamba is a small village of about 600 people. 
It is about as far from Wandi as where we sit is from the Indy community or the North Stanley area. Though Mabamba has a school and a church and a health clinic, the village is dependent on its neighboring district for some things, the most essential of them being water. Clean water is so important, the villagers routinely say to each other and to anyone who will listen, water is life. Water is life. The contaminated water in Mabamba's open well contributes to a high rate of infant mortality and leaves many young children and older adults sick for days on end. Our own Andy Cotton, who has visited the villages, says this, the water which the contaminated wells yield is little better than drinking out of a puddle on the road. But an even greater danger for the villagers occurs when the well dries up. Then, the people desperate for water may fetch water in the river, and there they may meet a crocodile and never return. A family will grieve. Water is life. In the biblical story, wells function as gathering places. You will remember the transforming conversation Jesus had with the unnamed woman at the well and Jacob's life-changing encounter with Rachel at the well. In Africa's bush villages, too, a well can be a gathering place, a place where people come together to share the day's news, to find encouragement and care to be transformed. Water is life. As I expect you know, Mark's gospel ends quite differently than do Matthew Luke and John, and that's not so surprising because Mark's gospel is different from the others all along. His emphasis, Mark's emphasis, is on discipleship, on following faithfully after Jesus, and on taking on the cross. In the end, the risen Christ does not appear to the disciples in Mark. The disciples don't newly encounter Jesus in a way that moves them to go out proclaiming the good news. Instead, Mark tells us that after the women see the empty tomb and have a brief conversation with a young man whom we presume to be an angel, then they flee. They flee in terror and amazement. And in the last verse of the original text, Mark says, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Silence. Crickets, we might say. It's Easter Sunday. Our expectations are high. This is the highest of holy days, lilies, newly purchased and freshly pressed dresses, brass, timpani, sunshine, gathered family, a bounteous feast yet to be shared, and all the preacher has to say is, they say nothing. The women are afraid. Throughout Mark's gospel, the disciples have struggled to make sense of what Jesus is saying. They hear, but they just don't get it. They try, but fail over and over again. They ask questions when they should be ready to affirm what they have already seen and experienced in the life of Jesus. We should not be surprised, then, that Mark's story terminates abruptly with fear, with flight, with silence. But that's not the end of the story. On the third day, the women see for themselves that the place where Jesus had been put to rest is empty. And the angel says, he has been raised. He is not here. The young man tells the women that Jesus is going ahead of them to Galilee, 
just as he had told them. And so now, realization begins to dawn. Many of the predictions of Jesus have now been realized. The finding of the cult, the betrayal of Judas, the denial by Peter, the failure and flight of all the disciples, the rejection, the delivering up and condemnation, the mocking, the death, and now, just as he said, resurrection. Perhaps the women maintain their silence for a time, but finally their tongues are loosed. In Galilee, in the midst of their daily lives, the women finally understand. Everything, everything Jesus told them has come to fruition. They meet the living Christ at the well, and in their conversations and in all their comings and goings. They tell the disciples what they have seen and heard, and the disciples also go and tell. And they encounter the living Christ in their work, and in their homes, in their struggles, and in their triumphs. The crucifixion seemed to end the story, but it did not. And the resurrection does not really end the story either. The resurrection story continues. It continues in Galilee and in Albemarle and in Mbamba and at Montagne de Luz. It continues in Washington, D.C. and in seats of power everywhere. And the story continues where there is poverty and where there is hope and even in places where there is little to hope for. The story continues in the midst of confusion and tragedy and in the everyday joys of children laughing in the rain, crying over a skinned knee, eating cotton candy. The story of resurrection continues through life-giving ministries which save young girls from sexual servitude and children from abuse through ministries which raise awareness and fight addiction. As Mark concludes his gospel, I believe he wants us to be what comes next. Mark engages us in the story of the one who has been raised so that we may go out as faithful disciples. We do so with the good news of the resurrection and assured that wherever we go, God has gone ahead of us. The God who raises Jesus takes on the burden. The God who raises Jesus from the dead prepares the way and empowers disciples in every time and place. And that is why we answer the villagers' simple prayer, remember us with the gifts of our lives. We who have not met her have no genuine understanding of her situation. We who use far more water in our daily shower than she uses in an entire day recognize that the resurrection calls us to share the good news with our words and with our lives. And so, not many months from now, some of us will return to Mabamba and other African villages because of your faithfulness, because of your generosity, we will share with that community the gift of a simple community well. And when the woman takes the hand of one of our missionaries, she will hear the words, the members of First Presbyterian Church remember you. And she will know her prayer has been answered. The risen Christ will be in that moment. The life of a bush community transformed. 
water is life. And the life of this community transformed in giving and in receiving. Loving God, loving neighbor. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed on this day, in this place, and on every day, in every place, Christ is risen. Alleluia. Amen.